Can you hear that? All right, so um, it's truly a privilege to invite my dear friend John Katzman into this auditorium. Um, let's give him another round of applause. All right. So you, I don't think you can see the audience, but uh, we've got a, a room f uh, filled with uh, people here from all walks of life, um, startups, investors, uh, educators, um, talking heads, philosophers, etc. cetera. Um, anticipation has been building throughout the day, um, uh, culminating in this because as John, I think you know, um, in Israel, there's definitely uh, an ed tech scene brewing, but um, it's relatively early. And, um, and I would say that um, this community has not spent a lot of time around entrepreneurs who have um, spent the last several decades building scaled education companies like you have. So I'd love to start this by just having you introduce yourself and, um, and go back to the beginning because I think the first uh, education business that you started was right after college. So it'd be great if you could just talk about why you decided to do that, what was on your mind when you did it, and just walk us through the first uh, few successes that you had and, um, and then you know, take us to what you're up to now. And I'll pause, um, pause you along the way perhaps, but um, It'd be great if that was the first segment. Second one, I just I know there are a couple topics that um, you're thinking about a lot today, and I'd love to cover that, and then possibly leave a few minutes open for a Q and A. Terrific. So the so the first question is describe the last thirty years. <clears throat> you could start with that thirty one if you want. That senior year would would, uh, would be a good one. First of all, I am so sorry that I couldn't be there uh, today. I, I almost got on a plane yesterday, uh, despite everything going on here. Be there next year, um, and that and thanks for that kind reception. It's great seeing you, Josh. The the um, in a nutshell, I started the Princeton Review when I graduated college. Um, very briefly, worked on Wall Street actually for about six weeks uh, before doing that, and and said that this was undoubtedly going to be much more fun, and it has been. And ran uh, um, organically for over 20 years and finally took it public, realized I hated running a public company. Um, and, and Princeton Review is test preparation, college admissions, um, and a division that, that worked with K-12 schools on, uh, on what's called a formative assessment, trying to help you use data to, to inform instruction. Um, left there to start a company now called 2U, uh, which works with universities to create online programs. Ran that only for about four or five years, uh, raised $100 million in VC, so did it in a very different way. And uh, the board at some point decided it wanted to take the company public, and I thought it was a time to, to exit. Uh, did that to launch a studio called the Noodle Companies. Uh, we have four operating companies at this point, all of which are trying to solve a certain problem in, 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 in education writ large, uh, but different slices of it. Uh, and I've been running that uh, 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 ever since, and I don't think any IPOs are in there, so, so I'm going to stick with this. So, jo John, let me ask you one one question is it took a hundred million dollars to to get to you to the point where it was ready for ipo and that's a obviously a huge number we're you know here talking with a bunch of startups in education how do you think about capital and you know did you go in knowing that you needed to raise that amount i you know i know it was it's sort of part of the model to to to, to solve for the capital issue up front in that case, but is it always the case that you need to raise a boatload of capital to build a scaled company, or are there approaches in other areas where you don't need that type of capital? Yes and no. I mean, that was an extraordinary amount of money, and they've, they're still not profitable, and they've raised another couple hundred million since. 
uh, in the IPO and after. Is my audio coming through okay, Josh? Yeah, it's, it, every once in a while it's a little choppy, but, but for the most part it's good. Can everybody hear okay? Yeah, thumbs up. Okay. Um, my, I put in the first uh, $3 million, and then I raised, I think, eight uh, to get the company launched. And after that point, really at any moment, we could have become self-sustaining. But it was working, and so we decided to double down and double down. Each program we launched was $10-plus million. We would raise it in order to launch that program. We wouldn't actually sign uh, a new contract with the university until we had the money lined up. So it really was uh, much less risky for most of those investors. Uh, it was growth capital and not, and not pure VC. That, that said, I don't think you need a ton of money to start an education company. You don't need nine figures. But the lean startup is a difficult thing to pull off in education. You're a parent. You're not that interested in somebody's MVP on your kid. And you're a teacher or professional educator, and you pretty much feel the same way. You need something that's tested and great before you're willing to subject your kids to it. So it is a tricky space for venture-backed companies and you can only be so lean. And I once argued for pudgy startups in education, and now I'll, I'll find a middle ground and just say fit startups. So to you um, was really about other people's brands. And I, I know I've heard you speak a lot about brands in education can you, can you share some of your thinking about, you know, do you need a brand? If you do, how do you go about building that brand? And how does that tie into how you fund it? You guys are all in the education world. And so you can probably name a fair number of education organizations. But go outside and talk to somebody random and ask them to name five education organizations that are, I don't know, under 40 years old. And in the U.S., it's under 100 years old. And most people can't. Um, yeah, Israel's a newer country, and, 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 and the numbers are slightly different. This is, a, this is a space that is all about trust. And trust builds slowly. So... If you started a school, uh, uh, it might be five years before you've built up the reputation to start a second school and a third. Um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work like social media where something can just click and be, and be uh, uh, viral. So in the case of Princeton Review, um, which we, we built a pretty good national and there are a whole bunch of Princeton Review offices around the world, so we have some reputation in India and in China. Um, that took, again, 20 plus years to build that. At 2U, my thought was USC. It's a global brand. It's a billion dollar brand that uh, is, is landlocked in a small campus. And if we could leverage that brand and to grow something globally, That would be really exciting. I, the, the real name to you was Tutor, two, and then T-O-R, after my dog. Uh, I would ask me, why would you name your company after your dog? And the answer is, I, I could name it dog shit. But, like, no one cares who I am. They care who I was in the back just to it work. So Georgetown, NC Chapel, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, grow, you can't find this way to grow an organization. John, the, uh, the audio is getting a little more choppier now. Can you hear me okay? I'm going to move if I can find better Wi-Fi. 
Um, I'm, I've tried to find a quiet place in my house. Hold on. What? Yeah. But then you wouldn't be able to see him. So There you go. All right. Well, so uh, that's a perfect segue into my next question, which is technology. So we're talking about ed tech, and there's been some discussion around big data and AI and machine learning. Where do you come out on the continuum of how much tech is, is the right amount of tech and how much tech is too much tech? And is there a difference whether you're talking about K-12, higher ed, or workforce? First of all, I would say there's a spectrum. Kindergarten is all about socialization. And the educational content, and there should be some kindergarten, a relatively small part of the equation. By the time you get to an upperclassman in college, it's much more about the content. And think of it as a sliding scale. And by the time you're a professional, it's even more about the skills, the network, and the content uh, that, that you're building. So I think tech can be more involved later in the game, whereas it's in a general position earlier in the game. Uh, all of the research, even on colleges, says that what really matters in terms of your life is your relationship with the other students and with the professor. That stuff ends up correlating to more engagement with work and a happier life, more contentment. The notion that we're going to save college by sucking the marrow out of the important part is crazy. So the way we should think about technology is, is let's get everything out of the way of humans interacting. An God. example of that, and one last thing, an example of that is lectures are not humans interacting. It's somebody in front of a room and people listening. Can that make it modular interactive content, but then come back into the class to have a real discussion? And it's the discussion that's exciting. That's a, the flip model is a perfect case where technology is improving the human interaction. So let's talk a little bit about measurement and, and outcomes. What's, what's on your mind with regard to, to, to those topics? The problem I'm trying to solve, both in my philanthropic work and at Noodle, is that the marketplace of education is fundamentally opaque and broken. That that opacity makes it very hard to scale up an education company. The good news is, by the way, once you've scaled, there's an, uh, that same inertia works for you instead of against you. But in the early stage, it's, it's, it's hard going. And, and that opacity starts with, we don't measure things very well. We don't, tell me how we measure what a good school is versus a bad school, what a good tutor is, what a good textbook or curriculum is, and, and, that you've gotten buy-in on those measures and that as a community we are, we are able to make decisions based on coherent data that we've agreed to. Once you get past that, you have a whole range of other marketplace problems in terms of that data, even if it does exist, isn't being given to you in any coherent form. And the decision that you're making, okay, this is a better school for my kid, isn't being translated into a simple process for actually choosing that school, depending on the country, depending on the city. So if, if you were uh, an entrepreneur now starting out, I mean, all the choices that you've made recently are you know, probably the result of you know, what you've done over the course of your career. If you were, you know, in your 20s and you were going to decide to go into to education or ed tech, 
would you be making different decisions and would you be spending time in and around the, the issues that you just described? And if so, what types of things would you be looking to do? I think the marketplace problem is, is, is large enough that, um, that if I were going after it, I'd go after a very small piece of it. For instance, um, we all agree on what the goals of K-12 education are. They are that over the next 40 years, your grad, your, the students who went there will be employed in jobs that they like. As the economy changes and as they have to be agile, they'll be able to navigate those changes and succeed. They'll be happy people. They'll have low alcoholism, low suicide rates, uh, uh, low obesity. They'll be healthy. And they'll be productive members of society. They won't go to prison. They'll vote and, uh, and, uh, and engage with the community. And so those things are all measurable, but when we measure them, we don't tie it back to the school in any coherent way. And we're worried that it takes an awfully long time to get that data, and meanwhile, bad schools can persist. So the notion of focusing, as a, for instance, as on better ways of measuring what a good school is versus a bad school, uh, something you do up front, and then refine over the next five years, 10 years, as students live their lives, is, is I think, actually a, a pretty good area for, uh, for an entrepreneurial business. At the same time, if you're not going after the marketplace itself, if that's kind of a, a big thorny problem, maybe better left for nonprofits and policymakers, um, I would just incorporate into my planning how do I measure what I'm doing and how do I, and how do I talk about it? At Princeton Review, we, we had an easy game. At Test Prep, the answer is, where were you when you started? Where were you when you finished? The delta is me. And so we could talk about average score improvements in a very precise way. Someone starting at this score level, where you are right now, is likely to get this many points and you should make a decision to pay us on the basis to the likelihood I'm going to get you that many points. In the case of other educational things, that's harder, but building measurement into your plan and right from day one, having a clear idea of what those metrics are going to be and how you're going to talk about them is I think really important. And I'll say one more thing on that. People talk about data, intuition, reliability, and accuracy. None of that matters. The first thing is persuasiveness. If you're measuring something that no one cares about, you're wasting your time. So the first thing is talking to prospective clients with different web pages to say, if we could make this claim, Would you buy us? And to the degree you're getting a really strong positive impulse uh, in, in, in interest in describing yourself that way versus that way, that's then what you measure. And then you shoot for reliability and, account and, 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 and accuracy. Thank you. I want to open it up for some questions. So can, uh, can we have one? Uh, one person with some courage to go first, and, and then I'm sure we'll have a few others behind them. Sir, and I'll repeat the question. Okay, at any particular level? How do, how do you see the tutoring market, particularly at the K-12 level? I'm sorry, the size of the tutoring market or? No, I think you're saying the prospects. Is that an interesting place for an entrepreneur to spend time or for an investor to invest? I think the tutoring market, it's still a, a really robust place. And just 
one word about it. There are two tutoring markets in any country. The first one is, I just want to get better grades or I want my son to work on his reading a little bit. And the second one is tests and learning disabilities. One terrible place to try to build a business because it's an enormous market, but the great majority of people in it are the teacher who lives down the street, your buddy, like a whole bunch of very informal relationships of people who either don't get paid or get paid cash and don't declare it on their taxes. As soon as you turn it into a real business, as soon as you start tracking it, uh, now it's taxable, so that doubles its cost. And if you're making any money, now it's three times or four times the cost of that guy down the street. It's very tough to compete with that kind of amorphous, uh, uh, off-the-books market. When it comes to high-stakes stuff like pets and learning disabilities, people will pay more because it matters. And so now it's a game of measuring yourself and, and, and having a strong research basis behind what you do. So just, just be careful about TAM, that's all. That, that the size of the market is, is about half of what you think it is, but there's still lots in that half. Got it. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you'll like this one. Because I'm sure the answer to the first question is yes. Do you know Minerva? What do you think about it? Yes. And would you like to invest in it? And could you please just disclose any particular interest that you have in Minerva? The question comes from Ben Nelson's mother. <laughs> and I'm sure you know Ben. I know and love your son. Uh, I think Minerva's incredible. And I think he's an incredible founder and CEO. I, with all due respect to you and Ben, I would not invest um, except as a philanthropic effort. I, I don't understand how it scales and achieves profitability. Um, the people he's looking for kind of walk on water, and there are just not that many of those people. And the, uh, th that, that is to say the students. And the model strikes me as very difficult to take up into, into a, very, a very large size. Um, that, says, that said, he's, he's such a smart guy that I'm sure when, he, when his investors lean on him to start being profitable, he will find a model that is. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to give you the chance to respond to that. <laughs> OK. Can we take, Yaki, how are we doing on time? Okay, so we'll take one more question. How's that? One more question. All the way in the corner. So the, the, the question is, what's your point of view on Bitcoin and digital currency in education. Do I have that right? Blockchain. This is education of drug dealers and human traffickers? <laughs> you want to refine your question? <laughs> Right. 
So no, just uh, decentralized currency in education. Does does blockchain have a chance? Um, I don't see Bitcoin as solving any enormous problems in education. It's not going to make the cost of education less. It's not going to uh, reduce credit card fees because no one pays for education through their credit card. It might, um, it might impact international education and the ability to, uh, to more easily take programs online from, from, uh, from other countries, but I don't see I don't see education offhand as the uh, as either something that itself is going to transform education, and I don't see education as a particularly large market for Bitcoin uh, or other cryptocurrencies. But I'm 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 curious as to if somebody has a path to make it more interesting. Um, I'm all ears. All right, fair enough. To be continued. So when we thought you were, you might be coming, we put a towel down on a on a chair on the beach, and uh, and then we left it there. I'm absolutely certain that it'll stay there for a year, and next year we expect to have you uh, at this uh, summit. But thanks so much for your time. It was really terrific and. Can we hear a round of applause? I look forward to joining next year. Thank you. Take care. See you back in New York.